Okay, hi, my name is Alan Taylor. I'm the district fish biologist on the Blue Mountain Ranger District. This presentation was prepared by myself and Dan Armacardi, who's also a fish biologist on the district. Uh, feel free to catch either one of us if you have any questions about the information we're about to share. So we'll be discussing the Big Mosquito Project fisheries resource story for existing condition. Figured we'd start off with a discussion about the uh, the fish species that are present in the project area. Um, there's a number of aquatic species in the project area, however, this talk is going to focus on some of the more focal species, uh, the, mostly the, the salmonids. So there's uh, Mid-Columbia River steelhead are in the project area. They're ESA listed as threatened with critical habitat. There's approximately 36 miles of critical habitat within the project area. There's also Mid-Columbia River Spring Chinook. They, are, uh, they have essential fish habitat designated for them under the Magnuson-Stevens Act. It's approximately 13 miles of essential fish habitat in the project area. Almost all of that is within um, the Middle Fork John Day River. There's approximately two miles in the lower end of Big Creek. There's also Columbia River bull trout. They are uh, listed as threatened under the ESA with critical habitat, approximately 24 miles. And lastly, there's also uh, red band trout. <clears throat> they are a Malheur National Forest Management indicator species. Uh, again, there's approximately 36 miles of, of their habitat within the project area. And we don't have very much uh, monitoring information available for them because they are the exact same species as uh, uh, summer steelhead, um, except that they have a, a, a radically different life history type. So steelhead uh, migrate out to the ocean, and red band trout, they are the, the resident fish. And so um, up until a certain size class, it's, it's impossible to tell uh, the difference between the two species. Um, there's a variety of uh, estimates that are available on historical abundance versus current abundance uh, for, for these species. Um, I'll just mention that under the, under the, the most dire circumstances, um, information shows that uh, steelhead and chinook in the Middle Fork are at approximately 12% of their historical abundance. So the data that we have uh, to inform our existing condition uh, includes... Uh, Forest Service Region 6 stream surveys. Uh, we've uh, surveyed um, every fish-bearing stream within the project area at least once. There's also some uh, pack fish in fish biological monitoring sites. Uh, pardon me, there's one. It's on Deadwood Creek, and we have two readings of that, 2005 and 2010. And that's a more intensive uh, monitoring in a focused area uh, versus the Region 6 stream surveys, which are done on a larger scale. Uh, we have uh, water temperature monitoring, uh, which also informs uh, habitat quality, and we have uh, pretty extensive culvert inventory, uh, basically assessing for aquatic organism passage at, at road stream crossings. And that's just kind of a, a sampler of the, of the data that we have available. So what habitat elements are important for spawning, rearing, or, or migration? Well, to start off with, it really doesn't matter how high quality or low quality a, a, a reach of stream is for fish habitat if the fish can't get to it. So one of the first issues that we look at is uh, connectivity. Um, the, the figure I'm showing right now is uh, a map of uh, the culverts within the project area that have been identified as impairing one or more life stages of uh, salmonid uh, passage. Um, there's somewhere on the order of uh, one to two dozen of them in the project area. Um, here's a, a figure showing the uh, culvert on Deep Creek, which is uh, passable for, we refer to it as a temporal barrier. It's almost a complete passage barrier to adults. It is a complete passage barrier to juveniles. There's a very brief uh, time window uh, within the year that it's, it is passable to adults, but that's, that's very brief and, fl and highly flow dependent. Um, there is another very specific example of, of a passage issue that, that should be mentioned um, at the, uh, where Bear Creek has its confluence with the Middle Fork John Day River. Um, there's significant uh, mining that occurred in that area 
there's very large uh, tailings piles that have resulted in uh, the confluence uh, of Bear Creek being relocated from, from its historical location to a new location roughly uh, a mile and a half further downstream. And what that's done to the river, or pardon, pardon me, what's that done to Bear Creek is created a, a series of ponds uh, that is uh, connected to the Middle Fork for aquatic organism passage for a very short period of time uh, each year, less than a month. ODFW has done spawning surveys for steelhead in Bear Creek uh, over a five-year time period uh, in the late 2000s and did not find any steelhead reds. So connectivity is very important uh, in, in terms of when, when we're talking about existing condition and, and uh, the quality of fish habitat. Um, and connectivity goes up. The, the importance of that having that good connectivity increases um, when there's uh, a disparate range between the locations for spawning habitat, rearing habitat, and migratory habitat, where those three primary components overlap um, connectivity isn't quite so important. But so connectivity, as I, as I touched on earlier, it's not, it's not simply can adult fish get to it. It's also um, can, uh, can juveniles um, take sh uh, Chinook, for instance, can the juveniles migrate out of the Middle Fork after they've, after they've emerged from their reds and get up into the cold uh, uh, refugia uh, tributary streams um, so that uh, over summer rearing habitat has been identified for, for all the fish species within uh, the project area as being, as being a critical habitat element. So overall, the primary subject of this talk on existing condition is going to revolve around floodplain connectivity. Um, science shows that good floodplain connectivity is critical for quality fish habitat. The a lot of the data that we have indicates that just if we were to characterize uh, the condition of streams within the project area, there's been a loss of floodplain connectivity within the key, key reaches of fish habitat. The extent of that loss happens to overhap, overlap with areas of historical disturbance, where natural and hydrologic, uh, terrestrial and, and hydrological processes within the watershed have been interrupted. That interruption has decreased the watershed's resilience to future disturbance. And for, this, uh, for the purposes of this talk, we're defining resilience as the capacity to recover from disturbance after incurring losses. So basically, why is, this, why is floodplain connectivity important to fish? So floodplain connectivity, is, it has an impact on, on virtually all uh, habitat elements that, that fish biologists look at in terms of determining uh, the quality of habitat. Where, where that floodplain connectivity has been lost, there's this cascading effect of changes in habitat that, that can have profound effects on the quality and quantity of fish habitat. Just this slide illustrates a, a few examples. So when, when that floodplain connectivity has been lost, essentially what happens is the energy that's typically dissipated across the floodplain, once it spills out onto the floodplain, instead of that energy being dissipated, it's, it continues to be concentrated within the stream channel. And so it's transporting um, quite a... It, it changes the size of the particles that, that the stream has the power to transport downstream uh, as compared with a, a stream that's got a good connectivity. Um, so you get this change in... An increase in particle size often happens. Uh, you get a reduction in sinuosity. You get a reduction in the number and the quality of pools. And all of those... Um, sin sinuosity, pools... Um, those are, are pretty critical elements for, for fish habitat in terms of, of rearing sites. And pools are extremely critical because without, without pools, you don't get pool tailouts. And pool tailouts are the spots where fish tend to spawn. Um, you get, uh, you know, in, in, in essence, without that floodplain connectivity, you get a simplification of, of the habitat. Um, oftentimes, uh, when, it, when a stream has lost its floodplain connectivity, it becomes in size. And when that happens, um, you can get drying of the floodplain, and that affects the, the density and the, and the type of, 
vegetation. You could get some some uh, less of hydrophytic vegetation, and so that directly impacts uh, the extent of shade. Uh, that also affects uh, the the quantity and types of macroinvertebrates that you're going to find in the stream, and the macroinvertebrates are what the fish feed so feed on. So what I'm trying to explain is there this uh, there's this there's cascading change that we see in uh, stream quality, fish habitat quality when flood plant connectivity is lost. There are certain critical elements that, um, for instance, large woody debris is a, is a key element where um, if you have had some degree of loss of that flood plant connectivity but you still have uh, a, a fairly robust uh, quantity of large wood, then that can help keep the stream from unraveling because of the the, uh, the roughness that it provides. But where that large wood has been uh, removed or is just generally lacking, then that it really increases the the risk of of the stream unraveling. So the disturbances that that occur on the landscape that can cause uh, this uh, loss of floodplain connectivity are both natural. Including, including fires, landslides, and flooding. They also include human disturbances, like valley bottom roads, some fire suppression, uh, logging. The roads are an interesting one because where you've got the valley bottom roads, um, that can also um, result in changes to large wood loading because you've lost uh, the, the wood inputs from one entire side of the stream, and wood is important for holding uh, the aquatic systems together. So before we dive into some specific locations that we found within the project area um, that are experiencing that loss of floodplain connectivity, we've seen this slide before. Um, this is uh, the distribution of fish within the project area. This is all fish. There are also uh, maps in the back that, that show the distribution of each individual species as well as uh, the, the habitat use, whether it's spawning or rearing, that you're welcome to look at. So this slide we're showing the areas of the, where historical mining activities have impacted floodplain connectivity within key fish habitat. Uh, there are a couple of key, air, key locations on Big Creek. Uh, there's also uh, one on Onion Gulch. Um, along the Middle Fork, uh, you heard about the tailings uh, that have uh, dramatically reduced floodplain connectivity along the Middle Fork itself. Uh, Deep Creek. Uh, there's there's a, a berm and tailings that go along uh, the vast majority of, of the stream there, as well as a valley bottom road, uh, and also the Elk Creek area, Elk Creek and North Fork Elk Creek, and a small area up on Bear Creek. <laughs> this is just some illustrations of, of what that looks like. Uh, here is Bear Creek. Uh, Middle Fork John Day is over here. Uh, basically, the, the floodplain should be you know, from way over here all the way over to there. And these piles of tailings have, have uh, ultimately um, basically reduced the floodplain width significantly. <clears throat> this is Big Creek. That blue line there illustrates where Big Creek itself is. Uh, the floodplain width um, is out to, out to this point here. And there are very large uh, tailings piles that, that have uh, basically dramatically reduced the, the floodplain width, um, the floodplain connectivity. These are a couple more locations on Big Creek and Deadwood Creek. This is, this is sl a slightly incised channel, but, but still there's uh, some excessive energy that's being focused within the channel. A couple more examples. Big Creek, uh, some example of the straightening over, uh, it's over widened, uh, very few pools and oversized substrate. So moving on, looking at some of the roads uh, impacting floodplain and habitat connectivity within uh, key fish habitat. Um, these red dots indicate locations where um, roads are actually impacting the <coughs> physical habitat connectivity. Um, these, these two locations here in particular are where the 2090 road, which goes along Big Creek, uh, has cut across the, the uh, alluvial fan of uh, both lost Creek and Pizer Creek and East Fork Big Creek where in such a manner that it has uh, reduced the connectivity 
uh, for uh, juvenile fish to access uh, some rearing habitat up in those streams. Um, as well, there's uh, the Valley Bottom Road up along uh, Deep Creek that I mentioned, and uh, they're down on Bear Creek. And just some illustrations. Um, this is Big Creek, and um, there's erosion occurring and channel incision erosion on both sides of the stream. Um, oversized substrate, this is, this is one of the few aggregations of large wood uh, in this section. I believe this is uh, Big Creek Reach 3. A few more examples. Um, this photo was taken from the 2090 road. Big Creek is on the other side of, of this uh, uh, pile that um, is essentially uh, protecting the road um, and, and restricting the, the floodplain width. Uh, this is a spot on Bear Creek where uh, Valley Bottom Road has actually captured part of the stream channel. And then this is Pizer Creek. Um, this, this culvert is basically right on the alluvial fan of, um, of Pizer Creek. East Fork Big Creek, um, the, the confluence has uh, been steepened quite a bit, as well as in terms of habitat connectivity, um, there are a number of culverts. Uh, this one in particular is a, a passage issue. And lastly, we'll be talking about uh, the, the large woody debris component um, and where that's impacting floodplain connectivity with, with in key fish habitat. So large woody debris functions uh, in such a manner where if it's present in sufficient quantities, it can help keep a stream from unraveling if channel incision or some kind of, of reduction in floodplain width um, and access occurs. Where it's not present, um, it, sorry, it, it, it functions in terms of providing roughness and complexity and dissipating some of the energy uh, that, that is forced into a, a restricted channel. Where it's not present, uh, as you've heard from, from Bob as well, um, you can get channel incision, you can get excessive energies within the channel, and you can get down cutting significantly. So these are locations, this is along um, Big Creek, East Fork Big Creek, Deadwood and Swamp Gulch, uh, portions of the Middle Fork, Deep Creek, and Bear Creek. And some illustrations of what that looks like. Um, very low wood, wood loading in the majority of Big Creek. Bear Creek, your Swamp Gulch. You can see some of the channel incision that's occurred. So, but it's not all bad. So we're focusing on certain areas. Go back to that map. Um, there's quite a bit more fish habitat within the project area than, than um, we're displaying in terms of the areas that, that, are, uh, that have some habitat related issues. So this is an example of what we call quality habitat. This is reach five of, uh, of in Big Creek. That's, this reach is, um, it seems to be in balance with the sediment and the and the wood loading, and it's meeting our large wood requirements. Uh, what's what our science says is a, a proper wood loading. This is a quality pool. We like to see that. It's a it's got more appropriate size of, of substrate, and uh, the sinuosity is quite a bit higher than in some of the other stream regions. More of reach five. Here's some examples of some quality rearing habitat. Lost Creek, Pizer, very well shaded. Here's East Fork Big Creek. So in conclusion, there are some opportunities within <coughs> the Big Mosquito Project area to increase the both the extent and the quality of fish habitat. And next, I believe we'll be hearing from, from uh, silviculture and fuels.